Well, welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to be discussing how to get book reviews here with Jason Ladd. How's it going, Jason? It, I'm doing great, Derek. How are you? I'm doing well. So we got a lot of questions. Uh, so we might not get to all the specific questions, but really at the end of the day, it ultimately boils down to how do I find reviewers and, you know, for my genre and how do I get more book reviews? And everything basically goes into that simple thing. How do I find people and then how do I actually get them to leave a review? So I brought on book review, uh, re book review getting expert. Uh, Jason, author of Book Review Bonsai, creator of the Book Review Bonsai program. And yeah, Jason, uh, please share a little bit about your, your backstory and how you got into this. Sure. My backstory is I uh, served on active duty with the Marines for 14 years. Uh, right out of college, I uh, got married and we started our journey in the military. I was a pilot, so I flew the F-18 Hornet and I got to do three years in the F-16 on an Air Force exchange tour. Uh, which is uh, as, as awesome as it sounds. It was very satisfying and a great experience. Deployed during uh, uh, OIF-2 uh, once, so for six months in Iraq. I was on my one tour there. The whole time I'm expanding my family, we, uh, uh, we've had seven children uh, since we've uh, been married there, and uh, my oldest is 14. Uh, and right around the 14-year mark, we had some really big major life decisions we had to make on whether to stay in the military or, or get out and do some other things. And ultimately, we decided uh, to, to get out. So I left active duty after 14 years. And a part of that story is uh, we all wanted to move to Alaska. Um, so my, my in-laws were going to retire up here, and it became a big family dream. And ultimately, we did it. And I'm coming to you live from on the backside of a mountain uh, up in Alaska. So, uh, but during this time, like towards the end of my military time, I had, uh, I had really started to develop a passion uh, for reading um, and, uh, well, a couple different passions. One was kind of my faith. I, I didn't really grow up with faith and I became a Christian as an adult and a lot of that was due to reading and thinking about things very analytically and so at the same time, the e-reader uh, was exploding in popularity. So it became very easy to read and it became... Uh, uh, very easy to get books immediately. So kind of two loves combined to create this reading explosion. Well, you can only read so much until you feel like you need an outlet at some point, and so you probably just want to start writing now. And I, I kind of felt the same way. And I tried to decide what I wanted to do, and I ultimately decided I wanted to record my story for my family, so I decided I was going to start a writing project about about basically how I came to my faith. And then I later decided, well, I'm, I'm going through all this work. Maybe I should look into how, how to make it a book. And that's where I started researching how to get a book published, uh, traditional publishing, self-publishing, which way to go, and, and all, all of that. I, uh, I tried this uh, traditional publishing route. I queried, through, queried some agents and did that. Ultimately, it uh, didn't work out, so I, I didn't want to wait and keep going that route. I said, I, I want to do it now, so now I'm going to learn all the self-publishing uh, stuff. So that's what I did, and I. The long story short, I ended up self-publishing my first book uh, in November of 2015, uh, and it was very satisfying to have the book finally published. And I did ebook and soft cover and hardcover and audiobook. I I uh, narrated uh, the audiobook myself, got it past Amazon Amazon's robots, and it's on Audible and everything. So I did every format I could do, and the big launch day came and. You know, I sat there. I even did a periscope. Didn't know what I was doing, but I did like a live periscope, and two people said hi. Um, and you know, it, what happened was what so often happens. You expect really big things, and not so not so many big things happen. I only got a few reviews. I I managed to get some some decent downloads for the first couple of days and weeks, um, enough to get it to number one in a free category. And I had a pretty niche category, so. It wasn't terribly difficult for that, but then I did some paid promotions. I got it to number one of some paid categories, so that was really cool. You know, you could say you have, you've had a number one, or you've, at least you've hit number one, you know, for a little while. Um, but but the problem for me was I wasn't able to get um, uh, a lot of the the pr book promotion sites, particularly the BookBub. Um, if the people don't know what BookBub is, it's one of the biggest and usually most effective book promotion sites, but they're expensive and they're hard to get because they're really popular, so they're really picky on what they accept. Well, uh, I was frustrated that I was kept on getting denied for the promotional slot, and many authors have they've submitted 10 times and they get denied 10 times. Well, I basically was uh, denied a few times, and I said, I, you know, I think it's 
I think it's a couple things. I think I don't have enough reviews. I think I had maybe in the 20s, maybe in teens, but just a handful of reviews. And I wasn't wide with my format either. I was Kindle only. So I decided to say, you know what, I think if I'm going to come back with a lot more reviews and I'm going to go wide with the format and we're going to see if that works. But I, had to f I didn't know how to get reviews. So I had to kind of uh, learn. And one of the ways I learned was one of the groups I was part of uh, w was talking about some techniques on how to do a book launch. And part of that included how to find, basically, and connect with uh, the kind of people that want to read your book. And so I executed some of those techniques, and I, I, uh, and I mixed in basically some automation to help me do it faster and to help me kind of scale it up. So instead of contacting 20 or 30 people, I can find a couple thousand people, narrow that down to a couple, you know, finally get commitments from a few hundred, and then end up with a significant number of views. And that's ultimately what ended up happening with that book, and uh, I got another uh, 70 to 100 Amazon reviews during the relaunch. So one year later, I relaunched the book um, and uh, a whole in the effort to get more reviews so I could get the promotion. And I was able to get, I think I had 130 Amazon reviews after, the, after that the technique was executed. Actually, actually, it eventually got to that. But for the, I finally came back to BookBub, and I think I had a total of somewhere around 70 or 80 Amazon reviews. And I was wide with the format, and I, find, I got accepted for uh, the BookBub slot. So that was kind of the theory that it tested. It kind of worked. Um, but in the, in the process, I had discovered this whole technique. Well, not really discovered, but learned. Um, this technique of finding the perfect people, connecting with them on a scale that actually is going to help you get the numbers you need um, in order to essentially do what I now call is uh, a book review campaign. It's basically launching a, a book review campaign. So that's kind of how I went from not being an author writer to an author to in the self-publishing to yeah, an emphasis on book reviews. Also, yeah, that's crazy. Uh, over 100 reviews which I mean, I'm sure many people here listening, if you could just get like a fraction of that, you know, some people are, it's like, I just need 10, like, just get me yes. like something yes. uh, going. So, you know, as you learn these strategies that we're going to talk about, um, you know, we're talking about things that can go to a high scale, which again, it's why I brought you on Jason. I mean, that's beyond, I have books that over have over a hundred reviews, but that's just taking years of like slowly coming in. So we're talking about doing it strategically. Uh, I also didn't know that you were uh, a pilot, which is what my dream job as a kid was, you know, seeing yeah. Top Gun and oh, yeah. fly, oh man, like flying F-18s or F-16s. That was like, that's cool. So, but we could geek out on that. We'll stick it to, <laughs> we'll stick it to book reviews. Um, so yeah, so there's a, a number of questions that have, have come in, but ultimately, like I said, one of the big questions that comes is for insert category, how do I find reviewers for uh, children's books or for um, recipe books or this genre or that genre? I, I noticed there's a trend of that. So really the first thing that I'd like to explore and get your thoughts on, um, Jason, I'll share a few of my thoughts, but then uh, what you think about finding reviewers who, who are part of your ideal audience. Some of the slow but ineffective strategies I've done are, well, slow but effective would be um, you know, going to Goodreads, seeing who's reviewed some other books, some of the Amazon top reviewers, uh, doing a giveaway for, for instance, 10, I gave away 10 personal development books and added those people to an email list and then I could follow up to become a part of a beta reader group. And of course you can do that in any category. So these are some ways that, you know, you kind of just get in there and hustle and find people and say, Hey, who's interested in X, Y, Z type of books. So what are your strategies? So then you especially mentioned, you know, being able to scale that to actually find the ideal readers for a book. That's a great question. And as you might expect, I think some categories in, in, uh, are going to be a little bit more challenging than others. Uh, just based on the number of people, um, that, uh, based on how you're going to find them, because I think in this day and age with technology and the internet, um, most people, the, the, the place you're going to go to find things and people is, is the internet. And certain kind of people have a presence on the internet. Um, uh, people who enjoy reading fiction, certain kinds of fiction, the really popular categories, the, uh, the young adult, the you know, romance or paranormal, there are certain big categories that you're going to be able to find a lot of people 
um, who both write the write the category and then uh, read it as well. Others, like a children's picture book, there might I'm sure they are out there, and it's all about finding that tribe and that people. Um, but it might be a little bit harder. Now, that being said, what I've found the key to be is, and what you're describing is what I call uh, finding the perfect book reviewer. And it's absolutely one of the things you want to do, because if you're going to reach out to people, um, it just makes sense to try to connect with the people that you think are going to connect with most strongly with the book. So, and you can go several layers deep into this. Um, but ultimately, that you think your question is, well, how do you find them? Well. It can start with something as simple as a Google search for um, uh, the kind of person you're looking for. So whether it's a children's picture book readers or children's picture book authors. There are many different categories of people that you can decide to try to find, but you have to identify those categories of people before you start searching for them. So uh, you have to decide right now, am I looking for readers? Or am I looking for authors? Because authors might be interested in reading uh, a free copy of a book as well. Now, they might not be as good because they, uh, they're busy probably writing and doing all the other things that authors do. But they might be much more discoverable. So just based on numbers alone, you don't have access to the lists of the people of the thousands of readers that a, a big website um, uh, has. But there are plenty of websites out there that uh, authors are a part of, and they uh, share a lot of their, where you can find them, where you can see them, they like to share their website, they want to be found, they want to be contacted, so they have it on there. So there's different categories of people. If you can, now, if you can find the book review bloggers in your category, then obviously, so book review bloggers is one of the, is one of the best kind of person to search for, uh, but at the same time, it's, it's not necessarily the best kind. The reason it's the best kind is because book review bloggers, you know a lot about them once you've found them. You already know they're on the internet. They have an online presence. They know how to run a website. They like reading books. They like your kind of book. They're familiar with the protocol of authors sending books and readers providing reviews. Those are all pluses. The bad side about book review bloggers is they're also probably the most approached and the most busy. Um, so there, it's not a guarantee, and a lot of them have their own, you know, desires and rules, and open for submissions and close for submissions. But they're a good place to start. But it all starts with an internet search, and you're looking. And here's the key: you're not just looking for a book for a book review blogger uh, on children's pictures books. You're looking for websites with large lists of book review bloggers with children's books. Because if you can find the websites that have the big lists, then you might be able to use some web extraction tools to get that massive amount of awesome data and just get it into a spreadsheet. And that just helps save you time when, because now you can visit all these websites without clicking back on your browser and pages to load. It's, it can just save a lot of time. And, uh, and you can even do potentially more with that uh, with some web extraction tools and just getting some information so you can eventually reach out and contact these people. Um, so in accordance with your country and your laws, uh, uh, what I, the technique that I like to talk about is specifically uh, designed so it's in compliance with can spam for the USA because I'm in the USA. If you're in another country, they might have their own different laws concerning who's allowed to contact who via email or not. You've got to be familiar with your own laws, especially now with GDPR in effect. You've got to make sure before you go um, collecting people's information or, uh, or, or uh, you know, sending email to people that you're in compliance. Uh, but in the USA is, is one of the countries where it's uh, actually a lot uh, more open than some other countries. So there's a lot uh, that you can do. So it's finding them on the, it's finding, on the, finding them on the web, um, finding websites with large lists, and then um, starting to use some of that data to, to even tailor it down further. So we talked about someone who likes your kind of book, well, if you have a list of 500 people, you might also have a quick description that they provided as well. You can even search for things that they might have in common with you. So maybe it's in an Excel spreadsheet, and then you highlight every cell that says military because you're military, or maybe that uh, is an animal lover, or that says children's books. And you can kind of use the data to even filter down. Um, so those are the first people you contact, because maybe it's your highest chance of success, because you want to find people that are really you're going to connect with and are, you think are going to connect with you. 
So it starts with an internet search to find that perfect book reviewer. Um, there's some technique and skill involved with how to find them. Uh, but there are lots of techniques, like you said. If you have, there's tons of list building techniques out there. I'm, I'm not the best at that yet. Um, but I am get it, but I am strong at, at finding people with searches and uh, ultimately connecting with them. So you mentioned a couple good techniques, but that's, that's, that's how you get started though. Yeah. And especially when getting started, one of the things to keep in mind is it does get easier the more you've built an audience, right? It's, it's very, I'm not going to say it's very easy, but it's certainly more leverage for the author that has 10,000 people on their email list and they got, you know, hundreds of beta readers and, and stuff like that. Right. So it's one thing to look at that and be like, ah, oh, so easy for them. Most all authors, I mean, most of us started out with the early stages of like outreach and yeah, yeah. exactly. No people You're on the right. list, one-on-one -on -one reaching out, connecting, sending personal messages. So it's, um, it can kind of feel like pushing a, a you know, boulder up a hill. But once you get it up there, then it, you take advantage of all that initial upfront work. So this is going to be some, you know, for me, I know that when I first got started, even in my last book launch, there was some one-on-one -on -one outreach. There was finding people who are reading books in my category, people just organically seeing who's leaving reviews on other books similar uh, to mine. And I th again, I think that was Goodreads uh, was a way of, of doing that and sending personal messages and, and things like that. And like you said, that was a great uh, tip, Jason. You look for points of connection. You know, oh, we share a similar, you know, it could be military. For me, it may, hey, you're, I know you're into music or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's like one of those things that takes that extra little bit of effort but I also in, invite you to think that when you're writing, especially multiple books, and if you're in a genre where, you know, for myself, if I write multiple books in personal development, getting a person who's a, a solid reviewer for one of my books, there's someone I can reach out to over and over and over again for future books. So you think about you're actually really, it's not just a one-off thing sometimes, you're cultivating a, a collection of readers and of fans and these reviewers might be sharing uh, your work with other people which is another thing that was great that you mentioned Jason which are like the bloggers the influencers because not only can they leave a potential review they might have an audience now that they can uh, share your book with so some great strategies and the mindset here that you that you brought up uh, Jason is leverage right? So you think about where are these people already hanging out or who's got a list of like a ton of people already as opposed to just like one-on-one. -on -one. So start to think about where do my target readers hang out and where do other authors in my genre hang out and form connections. And also another tip would be referrals. You know, so if someone is and active in a reader group, you might ask them, hey, is there a reader group? You know, are you part of reader groups that you think would be interest, interested or who else do you think might be interested in this? And they might say, oh, people in this reader group that I'm a part of, right? So if you think about early stage hustle, it's kind of some one-on-one -on -one outreach, but also thinking leverage and thinking about referrals to, to get some of that momentum going. I think that's, so, a, that's a great point. And that's actually, I think that's the perfect word um, is hustle especially in the beginning and that's a that's an encouraging part of my testimony with with the book reviews because you know my first book was just in 2015 I've only I've only published two books at this point um, but when I the second book I published was the a book on how to get book reviews and one of the reasons I, I even published I wasn't even going to publish that book at first but I decided you know what I, I know I've done this I know it works but I, but people need to know it. It works, and it's not just lightning twice. You know, can I do? Can I do this twice? So I decided I need to make it into an ebook format as well, and I need to try it again to see if I can do it twice. And my goal was to have a hundred Amazon reviews during launch week. And the book launched on day one, and on day six, it hit 101 Amazon reviews. <laughs> uh, and then guess what? It stopped uh, because I stopped. <laughs> so one of the important things to take away. But, but, the, but one of the points of that testimony is I'm pretty much a completely unknown author for my first book and really for my, for my second book. People aren't going to know me as an author unless I, I, me or someone else tells them about them. And there aren't that many people still at this point. So it's, it's really 
kind of the same thing that, that everyone else would be facing. So you can do it as an unknown author if you're doing the right thing. Um, so, uh, so that's why I, I did the second book there. But like you said, it really is in the beginning. It's a, and all that was, all that work that I, did, that I did is a hustle to find the people. And just like you said, it is one-on-one -on -one personal connection. In my case, uh, it's mostly e uh, personal one-on-one uh, -on -one emails. But the great thing is there are some tools out there that can allow you to do all your work up front. For instance, if once I have my list of two or 300 perfect book reviewers for my nonfiction book on how to get book reviews, and I've already got their name and I've got their website, now I can, I can do that hard work of an hour or two every night. I'm gonna, I go to each one of those websites and I learn something about the person. I find their contact information and I put something personal about them or connection in my spreadsheet, right? And I'll do that 300 times over the course of five or six nights. And when I'm done, I have 200, uh, 200 lines in my spreadsheet. I use a program that connects with my Gmail that allows you to s format it and set it up to where if I have a timeline, I can send you know, all 200 of those emails with the click of a button, but they don't go out as a mass email. They go out as one-on-one -on -one emails. And not only that, I can set, I can set up auto follow-ups to say, hey, if they haven't clicked it in three days, I want you to send up this quick little, hey, just wanted your, to see if you got this or want, just want to make sure this didn't get lost in the shuffle. So the work uh, really comes in the beginning when you're hustling for reviews. And why, why are you hustling? Because you know you need them to get promotions. You need them for social proof. You need them to drive sales. But at this point, you've probably already realized how important they are. I mean, if you just Google getting book reviews on Google, every single article that's going to come up is going to say how important they are. So you know you need them. How much is just a factor of what you need. I mean, some, some promotion websites, like you said, say, hey, you've got to have five five-star reviews or, or ten four-star reviews before you can even submit your book to, you know, to, to get a promotion. So whether you need ten or whether you want a hundred or need a hundred, um, it really, it's all up to you how much you want to work is because if you can find the techniques that get you the numbers, you just have to get the numbers, and then you get the numbers, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, and you have a, a beautiful combination of both the personalization, but also, again, uh, the, the word leverage, it's, it's not having to manually do everything. You can have spreadsheets, you can have some tools, you can have some things that help you, uh, so it's not, um, and I'd be curious to know, do you have kind of, if you're gonna send something to a reviewer, do you have sort of a, a template maybe that you could customize a little bit for uh, each person or how does that work? Yeah, you, you absolutely can and uh, I do a, a little bit. You know, the first email is, uh, it's a cold email, um, mm -hmm. which is different than spam and I have some, uh, some, uh, some instruction on that and one, one of the products I have, the difference between spam and cold email, at least as regards to the USA and in compliance with can spam, but you know, you want a cold email to be something that someone's going to open up. So, you know, number one, it can't be spammy. Um, even if it's not spam, you don't want it to be spammy. All right, you want it to be nice. You want it to be personable. You want that person to know that you spent time to connect, you know, learning about them. You've been on their website. You read their about page. You know what book they're publishing because you asked, hey, have you published, you know, that book yet? And then you, you call it by name. Um, and you probably want it to be short. Now, the first time I did this, um, this outreach, I actually made the template longer, and the concept I used during that campaign, which worked, was I pretty much made a list of all the things that book reviewers ask for on their review policy page, and I just put it in there up front in the first email, so they didn't have to spend another email asking me, hey, send, a, send me your blurb, and send me the page count, and send me the format. I just put it all in, and that part was the template. Uh, but in that example, I had some PS lines, and that had all the personal information. I said, hey, guess what? My dad was a Marine, too. I, I read that yours served in Vietnam, you know. Did he tell you any cool stories? So that they know you've got a, per you know, you're not just, just, you're not just blasting out a, uh, you know, someone to, something generic to a thousand people. That you've, you've actually cared about their website and you spent time on it. And, and I'll tell you, that makes uh, a lot, a lot of difference. And I, most of the, almost if somebody responds, they're always responding, thanking you. If thank you for reaching out, thanks for reaching me. Some uh, several people comment on basically compliment the email. It's like, man, I'm your email was so nice. How it mentioned my website and you learned about me. And wow, you weren't just a robot. 
um, which is always encouraging. I mean, just imagine what you would want to read. If somebody, if somebody approached you out of the blue, you know, you want, to, want it to be nice, you want it to mean something, and, you know, don't be rude, just be nice and polite. So, yeah, it combines template, and, uh, you know, so there's programs you can use that kind of combine a template with some personalization. The one I use is called GMAS. It's actually a Chrome extension that um, integrates with your Gmail. And it basically just, it takes a spreadsheet that you set up, and then when you compose your email message, you just use some very simple template code and it translates the spreadsheet into your Gmails, and away you go. Yeah, and you bring up something that's so important, because I know there's a number of authors that I talk to, and it's like, well, I've, I've reached out to people for a review, and a couple things happen, and we'll, we'll dive into kind of each of these sticking points. One is they either don't hear a response back at all, uh, or they get a response, but then the person doesn't actually follow through and leave the review. So with the first part, uh, which is they don't get a response. A lot of times it's because it does sound like a robot or it's not compelling, right? Just saying, hey, I got a free book. Do you want to check it out? It's kind of like, okay, think about what you're uh, asking a person to do. Even if it's a free book, that's asking for their time. That's asking yeah. for their energy, right? And how much that their time is worth something. So what you point out, uh, Jason, that's so great is it's um, – it's that connection. It's the human connection. It's that personalization. And from a relationship building standpoint, it makes a huge difference. If I, I receive, you know, a number of different emails, I can tell you I'm not offended if I can tell something's just a template, I'm, but I'm probably not going to check it out. I'm like, yeah. okay, yeah, generic email. It has to be a really compelling pitch uh, for me to, to check it out if I can tell this is just something they sent out to like, you know, hundreds of other people. But if they just put in one or two comments about, Hey, I saw your video on YouTube. I read your, your blog article. I checked out your book. I saw, you know, something where I'm like, oh, they're actually like, this is real. <laughs> they're actually connecting with me as a person. That makes a huge difference. Now, all of a sudden, that's like one over my attention. And it, I'm much more likely to, to read what they have to say and keep going through the email. So personal connection. And then the other aspect, so that's one key of the, you know, connecting for the, uh, from the influence standpoint. Then the other aspect is enticing or compelling them to follow through. So I have a few strategies um, that I use, and then I'm, I'm curious about what, what you would say, Jason, is um, one thing I do when I request a review is I give people a deadline. And not like you got to do it by this date. Um, it, it could be very subtle, more like, you know, um, would you be open to reading this book and leaving a review by June 15th, whatever, whatever the date would be, maybe a few weeks out or, or enough time. Even just framing it that way, now all of a sudden they know it's different than would you just be willing to leave a review anytime or whatever. So it has that. And then if you get their commitment, they say, yes, I can do it by such and such date. Now it's a little easier for me to follow up and be like, Hey, that, that time is coming up. Um, or it's like, Hey, you know, it's a few more days until, um, they're getting all the reviews in by Monday or whatever. I'm just making, it depends on the situation, but like I have some like real deadline, like on Monday, whatever the date is, we want to get these reviews in so I can follow up with them. There's some other strategies. There's a template in the, um, in the group, the Facebook group about how I, I, how I structure all that and ways to do like a survey, ask them to fill out a survey by a certain date and, and things like that. The point is a deadline and a reason, if you can give a reason for the deadline, even better. Uh, that's one thing that helps people actually follow through. So if, Jason, what are some of the th ways or what's your strategy for people that actually, um, you know, they say they're going to leave a review, they follow through on it. Well, if you don't mind, let me back up uh, one or two steps and then, and then, yep. and um, so let me back up. So from the email, so the personalization gets them interested, but we need, before we can have the, the timeline discussion and the follow-up discussion, we have to get them to reply mm. to that email because uh, they can read it and they can think about it and then they can, get pushed 100 emails down by the other 100 emails they got that day. 
So one of the important things is if, if you have the guts and you spent the time to learn about this person and send them a nice request to send them a free ebook for them to consider, you know, leaving a book review, then you need to follow up. You should follow up and you should potentially follow up multiple times. That's really difficult if you're doing it all manually. So if you have a program that can put that on autopilot, that's going to help as well. That's another thing that the program I use does. You know, when I send that first batch of emails, let's say I send 50 emails, individualized one-on-one -on -one emails, I've already set it up to, to, um, to have an auto response. If they don't open the email, you know, within three days, it automatically sends them another one that says, hey, just wanted to make sure you saw this. Now, let me just mention a few things about this. Again, of the people that have given me feedback on this, almost every single person says, thank you for sending the other one. I, I don't know what, I didn't see the first one. Because it might be the first one went to spam, but because you sent a second one, maybe now it's in your inbox, or maybe it's now it's in the primary tab of the Gmail. Or for whatever reason, um, uh, they see it this time. Another reason is because with this program I use, it actually, those, those auto responses are, are sent as replies. So if they are a Gmail user, it, it, I think it prioritizes them higher. So, but the bottom line is people are forgetful, people are on vacation, people are working on the weekend, and um, uh, don't, so don't expect necessarily a reply within hours or within days. Um, and you might even have a second one uh, if they give them another seven days because they might be on vacation. And if they still don't open it, so maybe send them one more that says, just wanted to make sure this didn't get lost. I'd really like to send you this free ebook. And, that's, and that can be all automated. And that's what makes it manageable. I, I, I broke down the numbers to, when, when I went back and I actually looked at the people who actually sent a review and I broke down the numbers to where these were people that um, replied for after the first email and people that replied after the second and third. There was a decent percentage that, that uh, I wouldn't have contacted, wouldn't have connected with if I hadn't sent the second or the third follow-up. So follow-ups are actually pretty important and they're going to they're gonna increase. I'm just pulling out a number here, but I would say they're, they'll increase your, your you know, overall uh, results by probably somewhere between 10 and 30%. Um, if you do that. One, yeah, one quick note on that. I, I believe the statistic is it takes on average, uh, most sales are made after about seven exposures, I believe was the typical Yeah, thing. I, I, I think I've heard a number, uh, a high number like that as well. And I think um, I've done some reach out where I've used that many. Um, it, but I think it all depends on what your purpose is. These days, I think that um, if they don't respond after the second or third, um, for authors or people who want to read a book, they're probably not interested. They're probably not yeah. talking about busy CEOs that uh, need seven to nine emails. To <laughs> yeah, yeah, and the idea isn't necessarily seven emails, just seven times of hearing someone's That's name right. or seeing something uh, come up, which goes to show you, yeah, what you're saying, you know, two or three follow-ups maybe, or even just one or two. But the idea is, um, like you said, people are, are grateful for it. I'm grateful when I get uh, follow-ups Again, there's a way that it could be if, if a person's following up like three hours later, I'm like, come on. But if it's yeah. like three days later, a lot of times it's because people aren't necessarily ignoring you. They, like you said, they didn't see it. They forgot about it. Uh, they had the best intentions of like, oh, yeah, let me let me get to that. And so uh, the follow up and this is one of the questions that came in kind of about nudging people or, or sending them reminders. It is. Uh, Again, think about your own experience. Is it ever helpful to have a reminder? Yeah. Again, it's you kind of play it by ear, but I like what you're saying with it's, you know, three days is a good period. You have some, you have some space, you give them some space, but then allowing for a follow-up or two um, to, to remind people. And more often than not, they're going to be, uh, you know, grateful uh, for that. Yeah. Um, oh, I just had a thought about something you mentioned. Um well, if it comes back to me, <laughs> I'll, I'll come on. Oh, uh, nope. I'll, 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 if it comes to me, I'll, <laughs> I'll mention it again. Oh, but so now that was a couple steps back to get it open. But and then your question was, even if you get people that say, "I'll read your book," um, you've you've sent them your book, um, and now uh, launch day comes and the reviews are not coming in. How do you get people to actually follow through on it? Well, number one, I think the only way to do this is if you have a connection with them so that you can connect with them. 
Uh, I think the best way to do that is if you're in a, an email relationship with them. So uh, the only way I think to really do this is to uh, do that book review campaign on the front side of the launch. Now, what, when I say that, think of if you know what a street team is or if you know what a launch team is, it's just a way to uh, get, uh, hopefully, a uh, hundred or two or three hundred people on your team, that's what you'll see the best sellers get on their launch team, you know, uh, that you're connected with and that are excited about your book and may agree to do something um, and they and they get to be an advanced reader, you know, for the book. Well, it's, it's really the same thing, but it's just you're creating a book, re a, a book review campaign team, essentially. So you've, you've found the people, you've connected with them, and now you can send them uh, the reminders via email that says, hey, the book's going to be live on Amazon tomorrow. And, this, uh, and one of the things you can do is verified purchases are so important, right? But we, uh, and you've probably sent them your book for free before it was on Amazon, so they already have your book, right? And you want them to leave a review on Amazon, but you want it to be a verified purchase. So the way to do that is to have them download your book from Amazon, but you don't want them to pay for it. They already have it. So one of the best things you can do there is to, if you're in Kindle uh, Select, KDP Select, then you can select free days. And then, you know, set up a couple free days for your launch. You've got your group of people that you've connected with, and you can tell them, hey, if I'm, uh, tomorrow's review day, I know you already have the book, but if you want your review to have the most impact and help me, you know, make it uh, the best, then I would love for you to download it for free from Amazon tomorrow. Uh, because if you do, uh, if you do that before you leave your review on Amazon, it's going to be a verified purchase, even though it was downloaded for free. It's a verified purchase. And I've even seen some rumors yesterday, I think, that, uh, well, actually, it, there were, there were rumors, I think they were, they were squashed. There was some rumor that, um, uh, there were some limitations on unverified reviews, but I think that turned out to be false. Uh, but those are, but I think the secret, the secret to getting the follow up is you have to have somebody connect with them, either you or if you have a campaign manager or, because if the people just, if it's all just strangers downloading your book, you have no idea who they are. You can't track them. And then you can't connect with them. You can't ask them to leave a review. But if it's people that you connected with, then you can ask them. And as long as you're doing everything within Amazon's rules in terms of service, uh, then it's good to go. That's uh, spot on where you mention, um, especially building up the reader group before doing a launch. And I know some people it's, it's after the fact. So, Hey, you know what? You take My first you can. book, it was after the fact. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you can take it and you can apply it. And then the ideal circumstance is what can we do to be prepared ahead of time? Right. And one of the things that like a, a really important theme that I invite everyone watching this and listening to consider is notice how much of this is about human connection. Notice how much of it's about even the psychology and the language of saying, you know, download the book for free today, or it's only going to be free today for the, you know, the reviewers to do it, um, uh, you know, by tomorrow or whatever. And these specific calls to action, things like deadlines, calls to action, specificity, all of that plays such an important role in the follow-up and, and all these pieces versus like, hey, will you leave a review sometime? Sure, I'd love to review your book. And then that's it. Like if that's as far as it ever goes, it's leaving it too open. And, and the mindset here is that your book, it might be your world and your launch might be like your world, like, oh, my launch is coming up. It's on the, but to the reviewer, it's just one of like all these other things on a checklist. So again, I know that there can be a hesitancy, like, well, I don't want to annoy people or, you know, all that. And there's a way to find the balance where it's like, okay, don't just like pester them. But at the same time, do follow up and let them know, hey, it's coming up. Hey, the launch is tomorrow. Hey, did you download your book today? You know, one message a day, uh, you know, maybe right around launch time or, you know, a message every few days, especially when they're a part of a launch campaign. It's like an excuse, so to speak, to be sending them updates. Like we're a week out from the launch, we're three days out from the launch. And it gives you that permission where people have signed up and they, especially when they say like, I want 
to receive notifications. I, you know, I agree to leave a review, an honest review and things like that. So you think about how do you create the container and how do you create that relationship so that it's natural and organic to be updating them on how things come along, to be following up and to be reaching out with them. Would you say that's how you approach it, Jason? Uh, absolutely. I think that's spot on. And I, I did remember the thing that I forgot a few minutes ago. Um, you were mentioning the deadlines. So a note about deadlines, that, I think that was a great point. A lot of people, a lot of people are hesitant to give deadlines because they think it's being presumptuous or rude, but people that are, people that are high product, productivity, productivity people love deadlines. They actually want the deadline. And if you give them a deadline of seven weeks, they're going to do your task six weeks and six days from now. But if you give them a deadline of five days, then you're going to have your product in four days. All right? They don't even necessarily mind if it's quick. They just want to know what their timeline is so that they can make it. Um, but here's a word on deadlines. So uh, once you get a reply and someone says, hey, I'd be willing to read your book. Um, actually, let me, let me take this a step back. Let's say you get a no. Another important thing is knowing when to take no as the final answer because a lot of people no is not the final answer it's no with a reason they'll say no because I have 10 more books ahead of you that is not a conversation stopper right there and you should be willing to see if you can eliminate that barrier and tell them well you know what I understand you know you've got a stack um, uh, I'm flexible with my I'm flexible with my timeline how can you can you put me at the end of your stack and I recommend saying that even if you have a deadline, say you're trying to launch your book on July 1st and they said, I can't get to this to August. Don't throw away that potential review that might come. It might not come during your launch week, but it might come the month after. And an Amazon review is an Amazon review. Uh, so uh, definitely uh, work with if, if now if a no is a flat up no, it's like, thank you for contacting me. I'm not interested. I don't expect to hear from you again. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. Then do not talk to that person again. They've made it very clear. But if it's just kind of, uh, I don't know, really know if I have time for it and that's all they write, well then ask them what you can do to make it better. Hey, I'm flexible with my deadline. Uh, what you can do next is that I've found some success with, with is once you have, once your, once your deadline gets closer, you can shoot them another email and says, hey, um, I know I said I was flexible with my deadline, and I still am. However, now I'm trying to target this. Hey, do you think you could make this? And if they say yes, great. And if they don't, then you say, great, all right, no worries, just, just checking. And uh, you can still hopefully get a review a little bit uh, later on your timeline. So I just wanted to say a quick note on, you know, know when to, know when no is a final answer, and know when maybe you just need to remove some of those obstacles. Yeah, that's so perfect because, yeah, especially if a person gives you a reason, um, you know, obviously, like you said, the flat out no is one thing, but if a person's like, well, I, you know, I can't do it because of X, Y, Z, and then you realize actually that's not an issue or you can work on that, like you said, well, actually, you know, we can, we can make this work. Yeah. So, and so that's important uh, to be, to have some degree of flexibility. Another thing that just reminded me of it, it could be, if it is a, a time issue, you know, I got 10 other books, uh, you know, stacked up, it's, uh, you know, adding to the queue or maybe they got something going on. I'm really busy for this next month. Let's say it's that. It's like, okay, cool. You know, I appreciate that. Um, uh, would you be open to me following up with you in a month from now and see right. if you have some available, you know, you yeah. can just get the permission for the follow up then, mm -hmm. and then, you know, put a note follow up in a, in a month or whatever. Um, one of the things, so that's, uh, I was going to see if there's another, um, I might get to something. I feel like there was something on that that I was thinking about. But one question that came up, and this is going to be a real quick answer, but I, I do want to mention it, is uh, people ask about bad reviews. Like, what can we do about bad reviews? And mm -hmm. my, my stance is the best way to deal with a bad review is to get a whole bunch of good reviews, right? <laughs> which yeah. is essentially right. what, what, what we're talking about. Uh, unfortunately, Amazon... Even if it's, I've had reviews like I didn't even read the, the people didn't even read the book. It was a shipping issue. It was pff, all kinds. It's like, like a totally non-legit review. Uh, and, you know, who knows? Sometimes it could be competitors. It could be someone who's having a bad day, whatever. Amazon, 
is unfortunately not going to probably take down a review, even if it's not legitimate. Uh, they are just not, uh, from my experience, going to do much about that. So again, it's, it's getting, um, getting more good reviews. Whether you respond to people or not, I, I think that's a context-dependent thing. Generally, I ignore it. Um, but yeah, uh, Jason, do you have any thoughts on uh, handling that? Reviews? Sure, a couple, couple thoughts. Number one, every legitimate good book out there is going to have a review curve. And hopefully, it's just like you said. It's lots of uh, five and four stars, a little bit of three stars, and you're going to get a handful of two and one stars. So when, every, when those five and four star reviews come in, then just pretend you're a celebrity and, you know, it's the – it's the Academy Awards and you know soak it in take them put them on your websites for your testimonials and when you get a one star or two star pretend you're a celebrity and it's a tabloid just ignore it just ignore it don't fight it um, those are not for you the reviews are actually for the Amazon customers so you shouldn't be messaging them and challenging it um, the one exception I will say is if it's just a flat-out spam review for instance in my first book one of the few which is a it's a it's a nonfiction book about uh, uh, essentially Christianity. There was a review that was I think two star. It was a low star review, and it was like a page of almost like an essay on, and it wasn't related to my book at all. And then I did a search for this reviewer, and I found he had left the same exact spam review on other like Christian books. It wasn't a review of the book; it was just spam. I contacted Amazon and told him this guy is just spamming random nonsense onto review sites and that actually got taken down so if it's legitimate junk then you should contact them but if it's a if it's a person that read your book and they did a one or two star then you're just unfortunately you're gonna get that I would not waste any uh, energy on it the key to success is like you said overwhelm it with five and four stars and some three stars and you do that just by writing a great book that's the other thing about getting reviews you know uh, I heard from, this was from Michael Hyatt, popular blogger, speaker, former CEO of Thomson Nelson, great marketing makes a bad product fail faster. So if you wrote a crummy book and you have a great book review campaign, you might not be happy with the results because you are, you're required to solicit honest reviews. Uh, you can't coerce anyone and you can't provide anything in exchange for it. So um, it really is an art um, complying with Amazon's rules. Yeah, especially since some people believe they're sometimes intentionally vague, but you really need to, um, and it can be done. Right on. Yeah. yeah. And I love the point about, you know, go to any successful author's book page. You're going to see the, the one star reviews, the two star reviews. And it's sort of like, it almost reaches a point where it's like, is an author really successful? until they've had those, those bad reviews. Like if they don't have any one or two star reviews, there might not be reaching that many people. So it's like, right. that's the rite of passage, I guess, to, to make it big. Yeah. Uh, and actually I think Adam Hoagie is the expert on this, but with the Amazon algorithm, actually, I think if you have no one and two stars, it might actually be fishy uh, for Amazon's algorithm anyway. So they're kind of expecting that curve, I think. And it's fishy for, the psychology of someone looking at a book, uh, I'd imagine, I mean, if you consider your own experience where if, imagine you're going on a book page and you see it's just got all these five star reviews and like maybe some four star and like no three, two or one stars. It's like, is yeah. this like what's going on here? It's almost yeah. like raises some, some yellow red or red flag. flags yeah, about exactly. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that's come up and it's not something that we, it's not something I get into too much. Um, and it doesn't have to be too much of this conversation, but I know that some people are asking about uh, paid book reviews. And so there's some legit paid book reviews. So there's some things that could be against the terms of service. So my, my quick take on that, there's things like Kirkus, uh, which is like you can pay to have a, like an editorial type of review and that's okay. But like paying for someone or even incentivizing someone to go on Amazon and like write a review uh, that is against um, terms of service. So uh, any, any insights or thoughts on uh, paid reviews, Jason? Sure. The, one of the key words you used there was editorial. So Amazon is sometimes clear in their terms of service, but uh, for the longest time and still now, Amazon, because Amazon has many products. It has books and then tons of other physical products. They've always uh, 
the, you know, the book community has always had a tradition of providing free copies, normally in exchange for a review, or review copies, right? Galleys, ARCs, whatever you want to call them. Well, a few years ago, Amazon is trying to crack down on uh, uh, reviews that were illegitimate, people paying for reviews, manipulating the system, and so they updated their terms and got way more strict. Uh, but they did still keep allowances for books. You can still provide uh, Amazon customers with a free copy of your book. But they did make a tweak to the language. It can't be in exchange for anything, not even a free copy of your book. So you can give them a free copy of your book, but you can't say, I'll only give this to you if you provide me with an Amazon review. Because you can't, that you can't provide any form of, it can't be any, uh, you can't provide any form of compensation, which a free book would be, in exchange for anything, i.e. review. So it's, uh, you, uh, so you have to be careful with your language there, and, and you can't require, you can't demand review. The bottom line is this, and this is what I recommend, this is, this is what I do. I tell people, I'd love to provide you with a free copy of this ebook. Uh, uh, if you would consider leaving a review. And then I put in the next line, hey, remember, you are under no obligation to provide a review, but I'd love to send you this free book for consideration. Um, and so that's one way that you're making sure that you're in compliance with their terms of service. So, but, but the one, so the, so the only type of paid review that Amazon does allow is what you mentioned was an editorial review which is a professional organization with professional book reviewers, i.e. Kirkus Reviews, the Library Journal, Publishers Weekly, things like that. That is the only kind of paid review. And not only paid review, that's the only kind of review where you can provide compensation. I guess you're, you're compensating the company for giving it to you. Everything else, it is now this really delicate balance of you, you have to somehow find the people, somehow get them to respond to you, somehow make them want to read your book, somehow make them want to leave a review when they're no, under no obligation, and hope that it's a good one. <laughs> so it, it really can be an art form, um, and there's lots of, and there's pitfalls at every turn, and I've stepped in every one of them. So it's been a matter of, uh, uh, you know, uh, going, stepping through the minefield to find out what works and what doesn't in order to ultimately be able to launch, you know, a hundred plus Amazon review uh, launch. Yeah, a couple great takeaways there. Um, you can do a paid review if it's editorial. You do not want to offer an incentive or payment for actually leaving a review on Amazon. And that's saying, go to get this book for free, you need to leave a review on Amazon. Right. Uh, you can certainly give it to someone for free. Ask them, like you said, we, if we'd appreciate if you left a review. You're not obligated to. Um, one thing that I've done is I've had people fill out a survey. You know, I said, you know, get a free book. Uh, I'll give you a bonus if you fill out this survey about my uh, book and get some feedback that way. And I might collect testimonials if they're, if they want to share that, that could be used in different places. And then I, I say, um, and this could be a gray area, but from my understanding, it's not actually incentivizing them to leave a review on, on Amazon where it's like, if they left me positive feedback on a survey, then I go, would you be open to also sharing this on Amazon? Again, no obligation, but I'll include a link because they've already filled out the survey. They've already said, you know, what would you say to a friend about this book or would you right. recommend it to a friend? So it's kind of like doing one thing over here, getting a result, and then inviting them if they also want to leave a review um, on Amazon. Well, and I think, I, I think the key is as long as, as long as they get the book if they want, as long as kind of they receive the book first, mm -hmm. then – yeah, I, I think that there, you know, there's other ways where you can kind of be creative and you're still within the, with the spirit. They still don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. it, it's when you say you're not going to get this book unless you do X. Uh, then whatever X is, or then the book becomes compensation yeah. for X and you can't do that. So, um, so yeah, but that's another good example. Yeah, great distinction. I'm glad you brought that up because I know that's, that's the thing that probably comes up so much is uh, that whole idea of being able to give away something for free for a review. And it's just, you know, so you, you can give it for free. You just can't demand uh, right. the review. It's no obligation to leave a review. Right. Well, awesome, Jason. Um, we're going gonna, gonna to wrap up. I know so many people, I'm sure, are curious about how they can find out more about you, about your 
I'll post a link to your to your book. But yeah, please share a little bit about how people can find more about your book, course, and anything else that you have. Sure. I'll just make it simple. Uh, if you just want to go to my kind of my personal website blog, it's just my name, which is jasonblad.com. Uh, Lad is L-A-D-D. So jasonblad.com. If you want to just go straight to get some information, uh, so this whole process I've been talking about, I, I wanted to share with authors. I put it into an ebook, and I actually I built a whole e-course around it because I wanted other authors, unknown authors that are starting from zero, to be able to learn how to get 100 Amazon reviews during their launch. If, if they're willing to put in the work, I've laid out all the steps of the video course and everything. I've called it Book Review Bonsai, and they can just go to bookreviewbonsai.com. That's B-A-N-Z-A-I, and you can get some information. There's a free trial, and there's a couple different versions. So uh, jasonblad.com and bookreviewbonsai.com. Awesome. So I'll get those links in the Facebook group uh, when this is done. Thanks again, uh, Jason. This is uh, really good stuff. I love hearing from you. I'll do a quick recap um, of what we what we had. So, you know, connect with personalization. Yep. Make sure to do uh, the follow-up. You know, you have it set. You know, if they don't respond within, you know, after three days, so there's automatic follow-up. Mm -hmm. uh, get people, especially to an early um, advanced reader group or some sort of early group, but you can always go back, you know, after the fact if the book's already launched. Yep. Have, have you know, timelines, deadlines, reasons to, to follow up with people and be, uh, I'd say, specific with the language, you know, are you open to leaving a review by such and such date uh, so that they really have that sense because, as you said, it happens for me. Uh, you know, someone will say, can you do this at some point? I'm like, at some point? Sure, okay, but that doesn't go on my calendar. In the next month or so, if it's in a month, I put something on my calendar for maybe two or three weeks to remind me. But if they're like this week, it gets put on for this week. It's just because they gave me the time frame to work with. Right. And yeah. so be, you know, that, that leadership of going, okay, what's, what's going to work? You can be flexible, but ideally you want to have it on, on you know, what's going to benefit um, you while still respecting their time. And um, yeah, anything else uh, that you'd add to that, Jason? I think we covered it. Like you mentioned, I think the key is if you're going to do it, I recommend you, you know, you start early. You can do it after a launch. Uh, you know, I did my first book review campaign a year after, but I recommend, you know, get ahead of the curve. I'd, I'd start doing this process if you can three or four months prior. Uh, if you have the time, if not, then one or two will work. But, you know, you need time to find the people, connect with them, and, and you want to be able to give them a little bit of time so if they do have a stack, you can say, hey, three months from now is fine. I don't launch till four months from now. It just gives you flexibility. So I'd say that's the last piece of advice. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, and wherever you're at right now, I mean, just imagine, uh, you know, three months from now, six, even if it's six months from now, six months from now having 100 book reviews, like what's that going to do for you yeah, and the you opportunities? Can do it. You, yeah. you can do it, and it, it makes a difference. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I, would, I do have one saved round, as we say. Uh, Connecting with these people has had more second and third order effects. I probably wouldn't be talking with uh, Derek right now. Uh, he's, I guarantee you he is the result of someone that I contacted uh, via this technique. So you can't even imagine the, the things that happen from connecting with new people. It's, it's really great. That's it. Yeah. Oh, thank you for, for bringing that up. Yeah, so many things in my business have been built out of relationships, and it's more than just – seeing another five-star review number pop up. You never know if that reviewer is going to connect you with someone else, if they're going to share your book out to their audience. I mean, all these things have happened from connecting with reviewers where uh, I think maybe gotten on podcasts before from connecting with a, a reviewer. I know certainly things have gotten tweeted out and all kinds of stuff. So uh, absolutely. Again, check out uh, Jason B. Ladd, L-A-D-D. That's it. And book review bonsai. I get the links posted in. All right. Thanks so much, Jason. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care, everyone.